interacting with your students you will you will get a chance to interact to, um, means you will have live interaction with them and you will not only learn these tools today you will actually participate with ma'am so you are definitely i assure you that you are going to enjoy today's this session especially a lot so doctor uh, i would like to welcome dr angel ratna bai she is uh, working as assistant professor in cit and crt we welcome you ma'am <clears throat> hello good afternoon everyone thank you uh, ms nidhi for the invitation thank you ma'am and uh, now uh, over to dr angel yeah uh, so very good afternoon i need one minute of uh, time so that i set up just i was shifting between two sessions so i'm sorry for that yeah right okay. uh so uh, i think like most of you have some of you at least i could see names of the people who has already attended our session ashok sir is there and uh, i could immediately seeing the first page of the participants list i could recall some of the names who have already attended sessions and uh, unfortunately this is a session you would have attended in already an sig training but every time we repeat this session there is new learning to take uh, ahead to go ahead though the session is on integrating uh, techno pedagogy and content together for a meaningful learning uh, how we really do it matters a lot and every time we move ahead every time even i do the same presentation for the srg group i learn out of the same presentation you know things at every presentation time so i'm not really here going to show you a lot of tools to learn but i'm going to use some tools for my own presentation which will become a demonstration for you so you should be watchful during this presentation so that you are able to uh, see that these are the things that it is it can be used in a uh, two ways one is uh, about how we integrate and also we also learn when we are doing online sessions how we have to uh, use digital tools how do we use integrate digital technology into our sessions to make the session more interesting and also how to make a meaningful session out of it so that's all i'm going to do about so let me share my screen and then we can progress uh, further am i clearly audible to everyone so if any of the resource person can confirm like or admin can confirm that would be of great right okay fine so uh uh this is will be my presentation so when we start we are going to discuss about few points now uh since we are uh, going to talk about technology pedagogy integration and then sometimes we are going to use the word ict we need to know the difference when we talk about what does i at least during my session what i refer as digital technology and what I, what do i refer as ict from the background so we need to understand so that we are all in the same class, same uh, thing for understanding and having a common uh, understanding when we talk certain things. and uh, also we wanted to little bit understand about why we wanted to use technology and uh, the third is how do we really integrate what are the essential components to be taken care for integrating and safety security aspect of using technology and the safety security aspects in terms of integration it will be embedded into all the other sessions so there's no separate point which i'm going to discuss but examples of safety security will be coming in and out when we are talking about these topics itself so this is what we are going to discuss today and to start with what do we really uh, think as technology can you quickly all of you type what you think as ict specifically what do you mean by ict in your chat box can you quickly type your answers so i don't want to listen to what is the full form of ict but what does it mean to you what do you understand by information and communication technology 
So if you can quickly write there. So one answer is technology which communicates information from one place to another, okay. Another is uh, information and communication text, okay. So it's all about digital information, good. Teaching learning process with the help of technology, right. Information and communication using user-friendly digital devices. Okay, teaching with technology to use techniques and logics, use of technology to communicate, integrating information technology in studies, communication of information, sharing of information. Okay, so at least now I have got some responses from all the participants, which clearly makes us to understand that is something to do with two things. One is information technology and another is the communication technology. So these two, everyone is clear because that's what your response reflects. But when we wanted to understand what it really is, we will go with this basic understanding, the definition which UNESCO, how ICT is defined by UNESCO is what we will take it as a common understanding for all of us. So that whenever I say ICT, I mean this during this session, okay? So that's what we wanted to try to take. So what uh, we mean by ICT is if any device, it cannot be like, I'm just putting in a broader manner. It can be a software, it can be a hardware, it can be a process, it can be as a single entity or a combination of anything, maybe a software combined with the hardware with the process. So it can be a combination or it can be a standalone. So any of this, which is used to create, store, retrieve, manipulate, send and receive digital information, then that can be called as ICT. So it is not always ICT means a single device, it is always something, sometimes it may be a combination of one or two things. Most of you must be doing biometry in your uh, schools, colleges, or at least you have an experience of what is biometry, right? When you're doing biometry, what are we doing? We just use a device, a biometry machine. There we go and put our fingerprint or it captures our uh, eye. What happens initially is already in the server, our um, identifications are saved, already it is created. Before we even go every time, it is already created. First time you enter your data, you enter that this is my five fingers and these are my five uh, fingerprints. And this is my eye and this is how you can scan my retina. We first create the digital information. All the physical components are like the, though the fingerprint is in our fingers, it is in a physical format, but it is actually created as a digital information and it is stored. So whenever we go before the biometry and stands, it again captures, it again creates a bio information. It retrieves the information which is already saved, try to map it. So that is where the manipulation is happening. It is trying to compare it. It is going to map it. See that whether these two are same and send an information to you saying that your attendance is marked. And it just won't, don't say to you, but also it receives back the feedback that attendance, once the, you say, okay, it goes and saves in your database. So in this case, if you see, Biometry as a physical machine is a hardware. There is a software which is inbuilt in that or it is installed into the system. So this hardware and the software together only can form IC, right? In our classroom, we have prepared a lot of textbooks with QR codes. We have QR codes which are enriched with digital resources. So there are two cases. One case is, uh, if you have any questions in between, I request you to please put in the chat box so that I can pick up the questions uh, in between also uh, and also at the end. 
So when we see like uh, QR coded books, it can function in two, two ways. One is in the book, there is a QR code. And when you scan QR code, there is some videos or something which is embedded into that QR code, which you can access only this much. This is one way of using QR coded textbooks. The second way is the moment you scan, the content is put like, for example, if the content is in Diksha, okay? So when you're when you're scanning and taking, it doesn't only gives you the content, it also registers in the Diksha portal that one person has accessed this content. So when you see these two cases, case number one, where you are, you have created a digital resource by creating a QR code and embedding the videos. You have stored all the videos in it. When you scan it, it is retrieving it. And when you want to play or when you want it to download, you are manipulating it, right? Till here, the complete process is sending. When you're scanning, it is also sending. And when you scan, it is sending the message to it that somebody is scanning. When you click on it, somebody is, then you receive the video as well, right? This is one process. The other process is when you are having a database, it not only gives access, it also gives the data at the back. So this is also a way of using. So you can see in the first case, the physical book, along with physical book is just like a hardware, physical book along with your QR code, which is actually a software used to create, and the resources at the back end. So all that are, the digital softwares are all part of your content. All this together, if it is there only, it becomes the ICT resource. Just putting book and QR code, not connecting any digital content to it is not a digital, it is not considered as an ICT. In the same way, if you use a presentation in your classroom for to support you when you are teaching, you are using it by showing it and you are keep on speaking. So first four are done when we use presentation in our physical classroom. We have created the digital content as a presentation. We save it and then we retrieve it when we want it in the classroom. When if there is any correction, we want to move, we want to zoom, we are able to manipulate. But the information which is created in the digital form is being sent and received by the opponent only through you. When you are speaking, the content is going on, right? So that is how it works. So whenever we are using a presentation in our classroom, it doesn't really, we don't really use ICT. We are only using a digital resource. We are using only a digital tool. But if the same presentation is shared panel, like for example, right now I'm using a presentation. Though I am speaking, have you got this presentation on your screen? Have you received it? You have all received it on your screen. We are very far apart. But my screen has come already to you. The, even if I'm speaking, I'm not physically speaking. It is coming as a digital information to you. It is coming as a way through this Zoom online meeting. That is how you are receiving my communication, not through a physical way. Right? So whenever we are in online presenting any presentation, if you see, we are also doing sending and receiving as a digital information only. So now I can claim I'm using ICT in my session. So this is something which we need to clearly understand before we go, go ahead. So do anyone have a question on this part before I move ahead? Do you have any question on this part? Right. If you don't have a question, let's move ahead. So uh, I want all of you to do a small activity for understanding why we really need technology. So I'm just going to use a presentation. So I, you also need to show, I'm not, uh, I'm using a presentation which I have already created. So this is going to be an interactive activity which we are going to do. So I have used this already. So you can see the benefit of it. So this is something which I have already used it. So I want to now uh, uh, completely reset and then just we go ahead for doing it. So I'm going to put this link in the chat box. All of you will click this link. 
when you click on this link, I'm also trying to open in a browser. Okay. When I click on this link, I'll get a question like this. Why to use ICT in teaching learning? You write three benefits. Benefit, maybe it is uh, easy, is one of the answer. So three answers. What are the three benefits? Write as one single word and then you have to submit. So that's an activity all of you are going to do. So let me see how many of you are able to participate. Ms. Nidhi, am I audible clearly? Yes, ma'am, you are clearly audible. So we can easily make out now how many of you are really active in this session or how many of you are just keeping your screen on and not attending the sessions. Uh, I could see 134 participants. So let's see how many of them are able to answer. Right? Seven people have answered till now. The number is going high quickly now. Very good. So let's take one or two minutes so that everyone could participate. So we are getting quick responses. Wow. 37 answers participants. Still, we are less for 135 participants. Not even uh, half of them have answered. So let's wait. So it's a feedback we are getting that out of 135 participants, how many of us, how many of are really uh, active in the session? So those who have completed, please keep watching the screen, what's happening. Can anyone raise your hand to tell why some fonts are larger and some fonts are shorter, like uh, smaller? Anyone can answer. You can just put up your hands so that I can call out. Okay. Yes, uh, Karbi ji. Actually, Karbi answer. Anglong. Karbi, Karbi Anglong is our district name. This is yes, the sorry, sorry. Yeah, please, sir. And my name is Shubhradas. So the larger one is uh, they attempt first attempt. The answer in the first attempt. Okay. Okay, that's your answer. Okay. Uh, somebody with Redmi 8A has put up the hand. So can I ask? Uh, Hello, ma'am. Yes, sir. We can use ICT for update ourselves. No, no, and, no. My uh, question is why, in yeah. this answer which is coming upon the screen, some fonts are larger size, some are smaller size. Why? Oh, it is it is only for, yeah, for highlighting, the highlighting the important point. things, madam. It's highlighting and, uh, important things. Okay, that's your answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Assam, I think like AS, Bora, sir. Yes, Jyoti Bora. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. 
yeah i think these words are getting highlighted because they are mostly answered i'm uh, yeah. right very rightly said if you see now 66% have given their responses 66 into 3 words so at least like we have got more than 180 words right so right now we can see in last 3 minutes 4 5 minutes we have got responses from 67 participants very quickly so one of the use of technology is that it helps us to reduce the time we invest in collating the answers and also you can see it, it helps us to speed and up the work the other thing you can also see if i get like this this activity i can conduct even in the physical classroom by asking one by one to tell three answers my whole one and a half hours will be lost in this otherwise even i can give chicks to everyone in paper write three things and give it to me but to read out every answer and find what is the most answered uh, point will take another half an hour or so but now if you can see in few minutes the technology has helped me to capture all your answers at one place and it also has done some analysis and tells me that many people have returned it as interactive interesting effective engaging attractive easy and active participation so these are all in larger size because these are mostly answered by people so depending on the number of people writing it so the same words so it is coming it so what has this technology has done now to me is this is how help technology helps me to make my work easier you can all of many of you have written that it makes it easier this is one example right technology has helped me to make my work easier many times when we wanted to make our teaching learning interesting or uh, uh, like innovative or to make some in intervention in our classroom the major problem we get is we have so many work where we have to dedicate time so if we can use right technology then it can help you to make your work easy right and i can see now 68 participants have participated in this particular thing we can see that 68 participants have participated how many of you felt really you are in this session can you just put your virtual hands how many of you felt yes i am also part of this session i am not sitting idle here somewhere i am with the resource person here few people have felt it, right this could be a reason that some of the view doesn't know where to click on for the virtual hand as well so you can see now i wanted to know the same way we physically do how many of you agree with me put up your hands usually this is our classroom practice so technology also helps us to recreate such an experience right physically we the way we ask you to put up your hands i could see here also people quickly putting up your hands very good right i can also request all the participants if possible if you feel comfortable keep your videos open because that makes our interaction better to see your face smile at you at least recognize you tomorrow when we meet somewhere some place right so don't hide your face you're all looking so handsome and beautiful right so we'll see you all thank you so this is something which helps us like the technology also helps as possible see the moment i say open your video many of you have opened your video but some people may be sitting at a place where you are not in a situation to put yourself before video so there is options in technology which is not available in our classroom this option is good as well as bad right some of you seriously listening to the session immediately open your video but some of you who is already teaching in your classroom but simultaneously attending this training cannot really open your video because it will bring to the light that you are not able to completely attend so this is like a double edged sword technology is like a double edged sword which have benefits equally the negatives equally the disadvantage 
but we always try to find out what we can make best out of. So that is what we are trying to discuss now. So, so one thing technology helps is to also understand, reduce my time in unnecessary things that can be handled by somebody else. Whatever I want to inform, I cannot put a robot to sit here and speak to you. Then you will see why I should sit in the session. Let me just watch. If I want to, instead of one video, if I take and play here, instead of me explaining, I can just play a video also. I was attending one of the faculty development program. It was a one and a half hour session. One very expert uh, faculty from an university was a resource person for our session. So he has to talk about blended learning to us. So he came to the session. It was a physical session as well. So he came to the session. He stood on the podium. And he started saying, hello, everyone, we are going to talk about today blended learning. And what he did is, okay, now let's watch the first video. He played one video. Then we watched the video. Then he said, this is what, what is blended learning. So now let's watch the second video. So all these videos were taken from YouTube. Some ex by foreigner were, was explaining, which we can't even relate our accent with them. So he played one video and then said, this is what is blended learning. All of you have understood same way he played seven videos and one and a half hours was over. So what is the use of technology there is, I can really present myself and I can explain the content better, but I replaced myself with the technology there. That's not a use, but we can reduce our work. Today, if you are taking a manual writing of a mark sheet, if you can enable the things where you are doing calculation using calculator, rather if you use a spreadsheet where you enter and use it, it's trying to help you to reduce your time. Then it's well and good. Something concrete content is there, which is a very abstract content. I'm not able to explain children. For example, I'm just uh, keeping my screen shared again. Uh, for example, we, we were teaching in the classrooms, right? Uh, we have been teaching in the classroom some of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degree. Some of the max teachers must have come across this Joji Bryce uh, yesterday in your class. But this is one of the topic. I'm an MSc Max student. What I understood is some of the interior of the uh, triangle, which we call it as uh, very basic, um, very basic uh, statement in mathematics. That is the basic for many things which we learn. Okay, this how is it taught in the classroom usually is a teacher tells this, I'm sorry, I better type the password. Good morning. So if I'm just going to tell this particular statement, many schools, many teachers just can simply say this. Okay, this is what is the statement is. Now let's solve the problem. There is nothing because this is in a textbook of class seven or eight. It is in different states and different classes. But if you see this, this particular statement is given and mostly the question comes not finding out whether it is true or false, but to apply this point and find, they will give two side angles and find the third side, only problem solving. So many teachers just state this as a statement and then directly get into the solving the problem. But unfortunately, this is the base for all the trigonometry things which they learn in future. So if you want them to really understand this particular point, there are various ways one teach, uh, a teacher can teach in the classroom the same thing. One is like this, draw a triangle on the blackboard using all your geometric uh, devices. Then using a digital uh, protractor, wooden protractor which we use for a blackboard you can mark like this the angles and uh, you can also i'll make it a full screen so that it's easy and uh, then you just start writing the sum point it out then you do calculation and say that it's 180 so this is also Uh, Dr. Angie, you're muted. Am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Dr. Miss Nidhi, where did I miss? Uh, if you can see. So that's just Only for one, two minutes. Yeah. 
Uh, so if we see here, the other way of teaching is a one one teacher can simply draw like this on the board and teach teach this content. The other way of teaching it is like tell every child to do an activity, take a paper, cut their own triangle, mark it, the angles, measure the angles, do all this calculation to find out. So at least every child is actively participating. That is the best way to do to make every child actively participate. But have they reached the learning outcome? So if a teacher teaches this in board, the content has reached to them. We have shared this information to a child. When the child does by herself or himself cutting a triangle, the child is actively involved in the learning process and the child has verified the personally that this is true. But there is a point is this is true for every triangle. That is what we talk as a generalization, whether that learning outcome is reached, whether the child is understood that for every triangle, this is true. A child has only seen one triangle in the hand. So that is where technology comes in. It is not possible to tell a child to cut thousand triangles and do it. So in such cases, technology comes in to help and show, let me show you. Yes, now you have all checked one, one triangle. Now keep counting for how many triangles it is true. So children keep counting, 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 whether they will be able to count. You keep doing all the possible things in a second, in seconds. Or within a minute, you can show that for any triangle I'm changing, the answer is true. So this establishes the complete learning process of this particular one generalized system. So this is how technology can help in understanding. There are many people who have written very clearly about um, how technology can create in this. You have very clearly written that it is for effective teaching learning process. So this is how a technology can help in really making it more effective teaching learning process. Also, there is one point which is given us is like very interesting, right? And also making them interactive. So you can see the tools, which are the tool I'm using now as a Mentimeter has helped us to interact, though we are physically away. It helped me to understand that you people are listening to this session. You are there with me. You are listening to me. It gave a little bit of a psychological input to me to be more attentive to this session, to be more, the, otherwise it will be like I'm talking to a system. Before me, there is a desktop. Right? This interactivity is something which we want to establish in our classrooms. One is interaction between the learner and the teacher or a facilitator, but another is interactivity with the content. How do child interact with the content? So I'll also take one of the example of um, science. So some of your teachers, some of the science uh, people would have seen this as a tool yesterday. So here there are lots of simulations. When a child really does, how it really helps them to interact with the content is what that we really understand. So I'll just take uh, one small example, which I'm very comfortable with. So uh, this was something which I experimented myself with some of the science teachers. Like, you know, I was asking the teachers in the science and KK, um, uh, just a question to them is like, how many of you uh, have taught PH in your classroom? So when they have taught PH in the classroom, I was also asking a question. Okay, so many of you must have done some testing, testing with the, uh, the paper to see whether it turns, whether it turns which color to which color and whether it is as many of the teachers, sorry, every teacher have done that experiment in one or the other. So then we were asking, so what is the pH value of lead? Is it acidic or basic? And what is the value? So many people gave the right answer. Most, some of them didn't know really because they told me the answer as yes, uh, Kiran ma'am has raised the answer. So let's listen to her also to see what's the response of uh, the, uh, yes Kiran ji, Patani ji. Please tell what is the pH value of blood. You can unmute yourself. Oh. 
No, sorry, ma'am. Uh, I have mistakenly done it. <laughs> okay, sorry. It's okay. So, can anyone tell me, like, what is the pH value of blood? Science teachers, at least. So, we are a little confused. Immediately to attend. But the reason some of them were telling is, ma'am, we do test with lemon uh, juice. We test with soap. Somebody has written the answer is 7.4. Okay. So there are values like which we have done, but we don't encourage children to take blood and do a test. But we all know that there are many times the pH value. When we buy all this beauty product, we buy a soap. We see what is pH value. How is it related? Many times we don't even see that when we buy a soap. Whatever is skin product, it has a very specific pH value to be checked out. If the soap is very acidic, you're not supposed to use them. But this is a basic application of science in our day-to-day -day life. But most of the children do not know because we have not established that to connect it, right? So we were saying that like there is a connection between pH value and our personal life. So to tell that there are certain people whose pH value in the blood has increased or decreased, which has caused a lot of uh, disaster in their life. So that is one thing to just relate. We were asking, okay, if you can't do something physically, can't you do it virtually to ensure that the children understands at least things, at least uh, help them to visualize it. So that is what we are just trying to do it from this particular tool, which is actually a um, uh, simulation. So we are just trying to take an experiment to see this is about the pH value. So I'm just taking your blood, okay? So I'm trying to choose, take little blood in the uh, this particular measuring jar. So I'm trying to put the pH scale, say 7.4. Many of you are right. The answer given in the chat box says, it's between this. So right now we are at the right, um, right system value has come. So now the question is, when I add water and dilute this blood, whether the pH value will increase or decrease. Can I see your answers in the chat? Whether the pH will increase or decrease. Yeah, same. Some of you are saying same. Assume that the water is completely distilled water. So it's not pH value is neutral. Two people have given same as answers. Some people say increase. Okay. So quickly, let us see what happens. Please observe the pH value. I'm adding water. What is happening now? Has it increased? Or has it decreased? So we can see our answers were wrong. Right? You can see most of them have said increase and decrease. No one has said decrease. They have mostly said increase and remain same. The response is wrong. Why is it happening? Maybe now it is shown that it is in a decrease. So why is this happening? What is the reason for the pH value getting decreased when, uh, when uh, we have added water? Would like anyone like to explain it? Can you raise your virtual hand? Okay, I don't see a response. Not even in the chat box. Okay, as water is neutral. Okay, so if it is neutral, why is it decreasing? It should remain the same, right? That's why many people have given the name, uh, given the pH value will remain same. Yeah, sir has given that OH ion is increased, right? But when we ask this question, why is it neutral? Many teachers said, whenever something is diluted, the intensity should decrease. That's why it is decreased. This is the answer of the science teachers. So then what we did is, okay, let's do another thing. I'll take a chicken soup. I'm taking now chicken soup. I'm trying to check it. So pH value is 5.8. So now if I add water, what should I have? Based on the previous experience, we asked the teacher what it should happen now. 
So the teacher said, now it will decrease because whenever you added water, it decreases. But when we added water, what happened, unfortunately, is the pH value started increase. So you can, instead of telling the increase or decrease, you can tell the children to try out themselves, to interact with the content of trying out their hands with multiple options. Make a table and say that doing all this time, this is increasing, during this time it's decreasing, during this it is same. Then come to the class and discuss why it happened. Why it happened? One person has already given the kind of answer in your thing. It's nothing to do with just the intensity being reduced because water is added. It is because of certain reaction that's happening with the hydrogen atom, like hydrogen ions in it, which is reacting because of which the pH value is changed. So there is someone who has given this answer already. There is a reaction happening. From there, you can start the real explanation of the reaction that happens between two acids and two bases. When it is reacting, what is that really the reaction has happened? So when we do such kind of tools, we use it in our classroom. What happens is children are able to visualize learning. I'm a math student and uh, during my, uh, till I finished my MSc mathematics, I completed my MN and then went for my first interview. Some of you who have heard this must be a little boring. I ex kindly excuse me for that. But the story is this, I completed my MSc MN. I'm now a trained teacher educator, very proudly. I went for an interview and uh, the interviewer asked me one question, please tell me what is pi? So I was thinking what a simple question in such an interview, after MSc MR, this is the question he's asking. I very proudly said, pi is equal to 13.14. And he said, again, ask me what is pi. Then I said, it's, around, it's approximately 22.7. Then again, he asked me what is pi. Then I explained, it's a ratio always constant, which is circumference to diameter. Fourth time again, he asked, tell me what is pi. I got really angry. What is this man? He doesn't know Max. He's asking me a question. So I told him, sir, I don't know anything beyond this. This is what I learned till my MS. Otherwise, it's all more mostly theorem. I have I have learned only this much. I don't know what to tell us answer. Then he said, you are appointed in this job. So I was so happy. A good company that gives you appointment when you don't answer to the question. But he told me, I should not leave you out from this place to spoil more children in the country. Where you have not understood what is pi, you becoming a max teacher going to spoil more children. He said, it's not your mistake, but you have never learned what is pi. Really, you have not visualized it. Then he made me to sit with him. And then those days, there was a software called, now also it is there, but it's a paid software called Geometer Sketchpad. Like GeoGebra is similar to that. He used and showed me. He asked me, have you seen pi? I was little really feeling to laugh loud and say, how can somebody see mathematics? Because throughout my MSc, they were saying there is an epsilon greater than zero, you will have a neighborhood. Neighbor should have, neighborhood in our context is those who live near to our houses, whom we are, who are friends. But in max class, always the theorem starts with this. Epsilon greater than zero, there is a neighborhood. I never understood what is it. I never know what it is. I couldn't see that neighborhood with my eyes. But the person was asking me, have you seen pi? So that was a real question that triggered me a lot. And then I said, I, I don't think that Max can be seen. Then he made me to sit with him and then he opened my uh, opened the software and he showed me why it is 22 by seven always and why not 22 by eight. Then I recalled a theorem which I learned in mathematics in MSc about a unit circle. A theorem was learned. I memorized the theorem. I wrote it. I got good marks in that, but I understood that is a theorem behind this 22 by 7, which I never understood even till my MSc because there was no visualization in our learning process. It may be a problem with the school or with the teacher whom I have learned, but you may be a very good teacher which who you are trying, but you can question yourself. How much we are able to make, it's not only with mathematics, with even other subjects. There are many abstract things like this, which we can't see with our naked eyes, 
there we really need such things to be brought in. Right? I recently visited Ladakh uh, in the last month. Before going to Ladakh, I never know what they talk about this altitude syndrome. Because I can't visualize, because I'm completely from the deep south where we don't have, we never saw snow in our life. We never know how high the mountains are. So when we went to the place, which I have never visualized all this throughout my life, when I went there, I could see. But can we give a virtual experience to a child? It took me so many years in my life to visualize, really experience that one point. There are many things which we cannot really give a real-time experience throughout our life. Even us, we can question. We talk about Ajanta and Elora Craves as a great thing about our country. We are very proud about it. Many times we say Taj Mahal is, we talk about Taj Mahal. How many of you of us has really seen a Taj Mahal? When we have not seen, how many students would have seen? How will our children appreciate our culture? How our children will appreciate the social sciences, content which they learn, what the history they learn, what the geography they learn? They'll not really appreciate. So only when they are able to visualize, they'll be able to appreciate. So let's uh, take a small tour to Ajenta and Elora now, who has not seen. I'm also seeing for a long time only virtually. So I'll also show you how I'm virtually seeing some places. So I'm just using one of the uh, tool, Google, Google Art and Culture. You can, uh, this best experience would be when you install the app and use it because now I'm going to show you in the screen. But if you install it in your app, you will have the real experience of doing it. So during break time, please, uh, I request all of you to do that. So I'm just clicking on Agenda. So I could see a lot of things. So now I'm seeing here, I want to see what is there in Cape 20. There are so many caves in Ajanta. So I wanted to see what is there in cave 20. So I'm just seeing the cave. This is how a picture shows us usually that in the cave, there is a Buddha statue. But whether the statue is on the left side of the cave, right side of the cave, where is it? So let me check it out. When I enter it, okay, this is how the cave looks. So when I enter through the door, there is a single room we can see that there are two smaller rooms with steps and there are some pillars in between. And on the again on your right side also two smaller rooms. And in the center is the Buddha cave. We can see here now. And is there any architecture at the top? There is nothing at the top. It's a plain thing. But there are certain paintings that has been done. Okay. So this is what is cave 20 is about. But let us see whether there is a difference in any other cave. Okay, let me visit 19. So we can see there was only pillar in a horizontal manner. Here there is a vertical pillars on sides. So let me see how it is. There is no additional rooms like the way it had in the last, uh, last uh, cave. Here there is no additional rooms inside. There is no small rooms. But we can see at the top such a beautiful architecture, again, which was not there. I have never visited Ajanta Caves, but I'm able to visualize how it will look by taking this virtual tour. So that is one of the way that technology can help us to visualize what we are learning. I'm just showing one or two examples, but you can think of examples in all your subjects like this, which is not possible to by seen by the uh, physical eyes of the children, but you can make them to visualize. All of you must have learned stop motion animation. Uh, one of the child, one of the participant SRG uh, training participant of Puducherry also attended one of the SRG training like this. When he went back, he taught children of class five digestive system how digestion is happening in the in our body. And uh, what he did is very simple thing. He told all the students after teaching, okay, we have learned now. He also showed them how to do stop motion animation to class five children. Okay, and then he told to the children, now we have learned about um, uh, how, to, how digestion happens. Can you really do an animation and show? So one of the child came out with such a beautiful animation where she has made the diagram at the background and then she has used papers, 
the color papers, like and white papers. She has torn the papers into smaller bits and made it into balls, like food thing. And she has taken pictures as well. It moves from your mouth slowly into it. So when there is a place where the all the fluid will be absorbed, she made the replace the paper with a brown color paper. Then slowly she is moving and where the food particles will be broken. The child has broken the bigger pieces into smaller pieces. So the child was that whole animation when it was created, helped the teacher to understand that the child is able to visualize the process of digestion. If you reflect on our own law learning until and otherwise we visualize, we cannot really have a good learning out of it. Right, so that is one of the thing which is very clear that technology helps in visualization. Technology also helps in engaging. I could have done the whole session without asking any question of raising hands, asking you to chat and I can simply run my session but there won't be any engagement. Hardly some of you will be listening to the session, others will be engaged in your own work. You will be engaged but in your own work, not in this session. Until and otherwise, I have to do certain things, the engagement doesn't happen, but technology gives me an option. Though we are not, a, we are away. In our face-to-face -face trainings, what happens is the simple thing is we will be able to see each other. So our eye contact will be there. It's easy for us to see each other and engage even non-verbally. But being away and being online session, it's not possible to engage just non-verbally. There is a need to plan our sessions in the way that we engage with each other. And beautifully collaboration. You can see 68 participants. Miss Nidhi, this is a hint for us out of 129 participants. So only 68 are active in our session. So we need to check out others what they are doing or if they have some issues in doing any activity. So we can see yeah. this, that... 68 people sitting at different places using different devices collaboratively made a kind of a word cloud, such an informative cloud. I can use this instead of a presentation and speak all the possible points. So we have created a digital resource. I don't need to create a presentation like this. I can use the same image. Collaboratively, we have created. So this is what technology gives us. There is a possibility in collaboration even beyond physical barriers. And it also helps us to use various multimedia. You have been learning about different digital content in the last four days. It gives a very clear understanding that how well you can use various multimedia content, right? And the last point is like we can also do a better data management. That's what I did here. Technology has helped us to take a better data management because I didn't spend my time in the data of analyzing how many people did. Automatically, I got a number here. I didn't check it out, which are the great things because backend data analytics helped me in this. This is how technology can help us. So we can use technology because there are possible benefits out of it. But if you really want to make it meaningful, what are the important considerations? The number one is we need to have a purpose for using it. So when you are going to create your digital content also, you need to have a purpose for creating your digital content. Why are you going to create a digital content? What is the need of creating digital content? So many times we create because state has a target. They have to write answers to ministry that the state has created this many content. So SRGs are selected to create content. Is this our purpose, number one? There can be a purpose because I get award for doing something. I get some recognition. So let me create content and show that I've created 100 content and distributed. Is that our purpose? So what is our purpose of creating the content? So purpose of creating the content can be established based on certain attributes. Number one, for example, uh, if we have to teach, Delhi is the capital of India. So I'm, I'm, I'm just keeping like unmuting yourself uh, possibility so that like, no, I can ask. You can raise your hands, so uh, virtual hands, or you can even open your mic and tell your answers quickly. Okay. 
uh, one at a time. So if I have to teach Delhi is the capital of uh, India, do I need a technology resource? Can you open your mic and keep telling the answer? No, ma'am. No. Yes. We don't need it. When, what is the condition when you will need? Is there any time where you will need, even for telling this one, you need to use technology? If the student is out of Delhi. If the student is out of Delhi. So uh, do you need location? it because the student is, okay, we'll take the answer, then we'll discuss. Okay, any other answers? Samars G. For location, where is Delhi? Location, where is Delhi? Okay, anyone else? One more answer. What was my content? Delhi is the capital of India. Do we need to see the show the location for this? Do we need really a child to be in Delhi to understand this? Uh, this is no, just no a factual information, which we are just telling that it's a fact. There are two places. There is a country, there is a place, right? In that country. So you are saying that Delhi is the capital of India. So number one is, this is just an information which you can even spell out in your class. There is no need for a digital resource. But if you feel the child is new from five to class six and you're teaching this in class six, where the children has not understood the spelling of Delhi and spelling of capital, because capital is a word you're newly introducing in this class. They have never learned this word capital before. So at least you should show the spelling on the board, right? Because when I pronounce, I may have an accent of my language. So I may tell it wrongly sometimes. So in that case, better is to write somewhere so I can even write on the board this. Or usually I can even just put it on a slide and then just show, flash. So our digital resource could be just a slide to show them. The other thing is if I want to teach them that Delhi is surrounded by these uh, states, if I want to teach a content, then the location is very much important to say that otherwise child cannot visualize what is the states around. So you need to show an image. So image cannot be drawn by a teacher, but the best would be to take a political map. Right? And show that Delhi is here. These are the states around. If you show a geographic map, they'll not be able to just find out the states around. So that is where it is important to choose the technology media correctly based on the content we are going to tell. Whether our content needs a technology, yes. What type of digital technology we should use there? Which format we need to use there? These are three questions we need to question ourselves. So sometime depending on your class, if your classroom is, you wanted to show, you can bring your uh, rolled political map from your uh, uh, library and also show your student. But if your classroom size is big, showing one chart like this in the front, children will not be able to make it up. In that case, you want a zoomed image which can be projected. So in that case, you may create that image in a digital form. So it talks about when your student needs it, you need to take this. When the learner, learner is one of the parameters which can help you to decide whether you need a digital content or not. Sometimes the context, right? Sometimes the context itself, you know that when you are going to teach this, you understood that the child doesn't have a resource at the home. There is no parents to teach them, especially English teachers, language teachers. When you are going to teach them how to speak, Usually speaking is only enriched when two people speak in your language. If the parents are not knowing to speak English and you are forcing them to speak and practice and come at home, how do they learn to speak, right? So that is where somewhere we need to take a technology like Bolo app where the child is going to speak and then the app tells back to them that you, what you are reading is correct. The pronunciation is not right. Reading, basically not speaking, it's about reading also. Somebody is there to correct. Parents cannot correct at that time. So because parents do not know. So we know the context that there is an unavailability of resource there. So I need to use technology here. So when we see these points, I will just uh, try to consolidate saying that 
whenever we want to use technology, first of all, we need to analyze the content, learner context to establish the purpose, whether we need technology or not. The moment we decide, yes, we need technology, we need to decide which technology, which digital form. Are you learn, prepare, going to prepare your digital content? So when you're going to prepare a digital content, again, it is dependent on the content. For this content, which digital form I require, the way we discussed the example. For this particular students, which content will work? For this kind of a school, which will work? I cannot create great simulation where there is no system also in the school, right? So I have to create a simple thing. If we have all the people are only connected with WhatsApp, I cannot create a very heavy book. I cannot create an rich internet applications when there is no internet connectivity in the school. So we need to decide which media, which form of e-content is suitable first. But for example, I have chosen that I'll go for video. Even when we go for video, we also need to decide that which format I will use. Maybe I'm a Max teacher, I'm going to record a video where I want to write something on the text on the board, where the board has to be focused. But when the camera is going to be kept in a studio, always the back of the teacher is getting recorded. And there is a comfortable issue with the teacher to write on the board standing in 45 degree to face the camera. So during that time, it's better to use a glass screen video technique. Most of the Baiju's video is like this. The person stands straight and just moves their hand in the front and the writing comes on the screen, right? So that is how we need to work on this, right? The second thing, if maybe like I'm a computer science teacher or something, like for example, I showed this particular uh, simulation. I'm not able to recreate like this, but I wanted to use this activity in my video. I cannot download and just insert it. So I can do a screen casting of it, record the screen, the way it is working. You're teaching social sciences. I'm talking about democracy as a content. I have decided to record a video, but if I keep explaining from my side, children will not understand. Rather record voices of people as a Vox Populi model format of video. Record voices of people, what they understood as democracy, which will help to have various perspectives towards democracy for the child. So it's very important for us to decide the type of the content and also to decide the right format. Doesn't end with that, we have to choose the appropriate tool. If you take animation alone, every animation has different tools. For example, if I take this animation, Pencil, Topi, Animator, Blender, Synfig, these are five tools here. But all five tools are for different purpose. Yesterday, you must have learned like stop motion animation. So pencil is a tool which helps you to create a stop motion animation using your desktop, using your digital images or digital drawings or moving a digital object. But Animator is a tool to create the animated cartoon characters. So these two are diff two different tools for creating two different formats of animation. So we need to be clear which is the tool which I will use. When I want to show a 3D view of my uh, globe, which tool I'll use? Can I use marble? I wanted to just show certain things like, no, I want to just give my reading material to the children. Should I make it as PDF and just share it in WhatsApp, which, can, which they can download, which they cannot download? Or if you know that there is internet connection, can I create my own web page using WordPress and then share the link with children? So this is how we have to, in the second stage, we have to decide the appropriate selection of media format and the tool to be used. And also the final thing to be discussed is what is this tool for? What is your digital content for? This is one point we don't really focus on when we create digital content. When you wanted to integrate digital uh, uh, technology into teaching learning process, it's not just con developing the content. How is this content going to be used? That has to be in our mind. In mathematics or in sciences also, we have about this scientists, about this mathematicians in the book. Many times we don't have enough time to even come uh, like, you know, uh, transact what is given in the textbooks. 
what is given in the syllabus, then where do we create environment for children to extend their learning and understanding? So there is a need for a lot of resource that can go as a supplementary material, right? Other than what you teach in your class, you read extended, give a video about a mathematician which you couldn't cover because of time. So can we create such contents? We are not focusing on this right now in many states. Can we also create enrichment content, which is not there in your syllabus, not in the book, but giving this will equip child to see what is to be done. They will be able to appreciate the subjects. So we can create content which are supplementary in nature to what is the uh, being taught in the classroom. There can be con content which uh, with digital resource that can be complementing what is being taught. So can I get your responses in chat box, whether I'm using now this presentation as a supplement or as a compliment? How am I Everyone? using it? Yes, sir. Uh, Sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Time is up. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. I'll take just next five minutes. So if you see right now, I'm using this particular image on the screen to explain better what I am speaking. So I'm using this presentation as a compliment resource. But after this, I can give a write up about my session to you to go and read afterwards so that it helps you to supplement what you did, what, whatever you listened here, right? There are ways we can use digital resources in an integrated manner. You cannot split it, whether you are uh, using it to support yourself or an extended learning. And there are certain tools which will be infused in the format. So you cannot take a separate technology and this. For example, this tool. Today I have used for this. Tomorrow I can change the topic and use it for science. Tomorrow, day after tomorrow for mathematics. I can separate the technology and content. This is just an integrated tool. But if you see GeoGebra, I cannot sub separate the subject and tool. The tool is built with the subject. The subject is explained with the tool. That is an example of a digital tool that is at the level of infused. The more we move ahead, the more effective our use of technology, digital resources. So right now in India, we are at this level of creating content. Slowly, we need to use this kind of a content to make our learning more better. Okay, so these are common things which we do in our learning uh, PE, our lesson plan preparation, always focusing on content. And then we always feel that these things we all know, so I'm not going to repeat, but very important point when you develop, we need to apply all our knowledge together. Already we have knowledge on content because we have done masters. We know what is the content we are teaching. We have learned be it, so we know pedagogy how to teach that content, which will work properly. So we have practiced all the skills. Chota chota hai na? Which is like pedagogy and content, PC skills, whatever is coming. We have ex already practicing for years. How to integrate nine pedagogy nine to nine content. Nine Reply to Oh. Oh. Okay, so the another thing is we have learned about psychology and sociology in our beard. We know for which context, there are varied contexts, we understand that. We know there are how the children learning differs, what are the learning styles, all this we have learned. So we are able to integrate all this, but one point newly coming is technology. So to integrate technology effectively, first of all, we should learn technology and just coming for five days training like this is not going to help us. So that is where a continuous learning process is uh, developed by CIT. You can go to the CIT website. Under events, there are two options. One is webinar, where you can see there is a daily online session. Even if you're not able to attend, you can click on the video and watch the session to learn yourself. Another is a training. Every month, last week is dedicated to an online training. So the de details will be given the moment you click here, you will get all the details how you can participate in this training. So you need to go through and then update yourself to come to this level. Only if you build this content, first we need to know the technology, then we should know which technology can help in which pedagogy, then we also should know which technology can help in which content. Then we can start integration. Integration is not directly jumping and mixing up everything, but a right integration. 
with each and every aspect is important. So when we are going to design, we should also think about, we should not forget the physical uh, presence of the child. Embodied learning is nothing but like, we should involve the physical part of the child rather than simply giving everything in digital mode. We should involve children physically, like for example, QR is an app where you can take a printer or print, a, print out of a coloring sheet, give to student, tell them to first color physical activity. Then scan the colored sheet. Then you get an uh, uh, argumented content on that. So that is the way we can make uh, the child to be embodied with the learning process physically, psychologically, and also cognitively. When you implement, try out something in the classroom, when you integrate, everything doesn't give positive results. So when you try out, please also do research which work, which doesn't work. Not a great research as an action research. Then also find what impacts, whether it is positive, negative. Try to build the experience, share it with each other. And the last is you need to evaluate. Mostly we evaluate the results. Whether the child achieved first 10 marks, now 50 marks. But that's really not the impact. Whether the child is, what is the child's reaction? Whether the child likes to learn with technology, whether there is an impact on a child's behavior, whether the learning process is going in the indented way, all this also need to be thought about. So when we are taking care of all this, we need to take care of our security and safety practices. So I'll stop here. Any uh, quick question can, if we can take only two questions so that keeping the time in view. Ma'am, there is a question. Uh, Ma'am, could you give a brief demonstration on, yeah. on how to create a simple quiz with Mentimeter? Yeah, that is one thing like, oh, now when we see all these tools, we wanted to learn one by one. But with this five days, we can't learn. So that's where I showed the CIT website, where in the webinar uh, list, there are 700 plus sessions. You can just go and search for Mentimeter. We have done already a one hour session on how to use Mentimeter for quiz. So you can search uh, that video and learn. So most of the, uh, even in this five days, we could introduce only five to six tools to you. But if you wanted to learn more tools, it is the right place for you. So I'll just put you the uh, link of the uh, place so that where you can just uh, take it and use it. So uh, any other question like, uh, Nidhi, if you can just check and tell me one more. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there is another question. Ma'am, can you please tell us about which app is useful for developing e-content for a particular subject? Yeah, this is also a very important question. And again, my answer is the same. So instead of me just spelling out one or two resources, I'm just giving you the complete resource links of workshop and webinar. In the webinar, we have taken subject-wise five, five days session. If you are a math teacher, what all the tools you can use? If you are a science teacher, what all the tools you can use? If you browse through the 700 topics, don't watch everything. Only which is you ready, interesting for you or useful for you, watch the video and then you can do it. Yeah. Uh, I'll stop here so that the time is up. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, giving us this very important information. This is definitely really useful and uh, teachers will definitely going to use this because this is uh, not only novel, but interesting to create and uh, to be used by students also. Okay. So thank you so much, ma'am. And okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm taking leave from the session. Okay, ma'am. And thank you so much.